Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. practicing with the San Francisco Buddhist Center community since 1993 and was ordained in 2011. His current area of exploration is the cultivation of metta, universal loving kindness, <coughs> as a response to all the hatred, discrimination, and bigotry in the world out there. Through personal anecdotes and experiential exercises, Dandasa will <coughs> explore our relationship to ourselves and others with a particular emphasis on our deeply ingrained tendency to see others as different from us. So, um, part two of the four foundations of mindfulness. Thank you, Grisha. And uh, thank you all for, for coming out and bearing the smoke. Uh, so I'd just like to start with um, uh, just answering a question, actually. Jerry, have I got that right? Yeah, Jerry stopped me beforehand, and uh, he asked me... Um, What's the difference between rapture and bliss? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, so much is lost in translation. Yeah. So uh, the, where this came up from last week was I, I put this chart up here, and I listed rapture and bliss as two of the uh, factors of dhyana. And uh, I wrote down the original um, Pali words, and rapture translates as priti, and bliss translates as sukha. Uh, so what one could do is you could go online and look up the uh, Pali English Dictionary and read about these terms and try and figure out what exactly they're getting at. <clears throat> but rather than doing that, I'll just actually describe it with, uh, with, a, with a simile, a little story. And this story is basically just illustrating uh, a spectrum of deepening contentment. So here's a story, and it's appropriate to, uh, you know, the time of the Buddha 2,500 years ago, or perhaps even today in, in modern Egypt, perhaps. So the story goes like this. So imagine you were traveling through the desert for many days, the sun beating down on you, and uh, your water is starting to run out. So you're starting to get a little worried. It's a very dangerous thing to travel through the desert. And then off on the horizon, you see some other travelers moving, coming towards you. And as you approach them, you notice that their clothes are damp. And as they pass by, you speak with them, and they tell you, oh, there's an oasis just over the horizon there. You're quickly approaching it. And this gladdens your mind. You get really excited about this. Ah, oh, this is wonderful. And as you continue to travel in that direction, you begin to see the oasis and the horizon. And you see other travelers coming toward you, and their clothes are wet. And again, all of their water bags are full. And this further gladdens your mind. And then you arrive at the oasis. What a beautiful sight, these palm trees and animals and lots of other people in this beautiful, clear pool of water. And then you immerse yourself in this water. Uh, just imagine how wonderful that must feel to just swim in this water, just bathe yourself and drink. And again, this is yet another ripening and a deepening of contentment. And imagine when you're done, 
you get out and you wrap yourself in a white cloth and you sit upon the shore of this pool of water. Ah. Oh. Again, this is yet another deepening and unfolding of, uh, of contentment. So the way that this is described in the Pali Canon, in the tradition, is rapture. Is Traditionally, it's described as, um, as, as um, um, contentment tinged with excitement. Yeah. And bliss is a deeper, so, uh, a deeper form of contentment where this excitement has arisen fully ripened and faded away. So you're left with this much deeper contentment when you enter into a state of bliss. So you can see in this analogy, you know, approaching this oasis and first getting into the water would be an experience of rapture. Being in the water then coming out, wrapping oneself in a white sheet, would be more uh, towards the experience of, of bliss. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. So I'd like to really emphasize this, uh, this, this language of a spectrum of experience here. Uh, so you can go down this path um, of trying to parse your experience into these different categories with this idea of what is present and what is not present. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah. I find it, personally, I find it much more helpful to um, relate to what's being uh, pointed at here as a spectrum of experience. Yeah. So I'll be coming back to this idea of a spectrum of experience. Okay, so now I'd like to just quickly recap uh, this, uh, what we did last week. And um, so last week we were focused upon the five hindrances and, uh, and the corresponding um, factors of jhana, as well as the factors of awakening. And the Buddha described the five hindrances as something that uh, we need to really pay attention to, and we need to really apply effort to abandon the hindrances. And I shared this quote last week from the Buddha. These five hindrances are makers of blindness, causing lack of vision, causing lack of knowledge, detrimental to wisdom, tending to vexation, leading away from Nibbana. Very strong language here from the Buddha. And then later in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha describes the process uh, by which we can abandon uh, the hindrances. So here it's a, it's a five kind of step process. It's all related to each other. And the first two have to do with um, present moment awareness of knowing what is present and knowing what is not present. So here monks, when ill will is present <coughs> within him, a monk knows ill will is present within me. And similarly, when ill will is not present within him, a monk knows ill will is not present within him. So this is pointing at present moment awareness. Now the following three here have to do with um, uh, with pratichit samapada, which is translated as dependent co-arising, you know, or put colloquially, actions have consequences. So here the third one. He knows how ill will that is not yet arisen comes to arise. He knows how ill will, once it has arisen, can be abandoned. And he also knows how abandoned ill will does not arise in the future. So the idea here is that if we understand the conditions which give rise to ill will, then if we can eliminate those conditions, then ill will will not arise. Easier said than done. Yes. So, um, last week then I um, used this example of getting stuck in traffic. Uh, that causes me ill will. That causes me frustration. 
and the condition of getting stuck in traffic, well, I can simply avoid getting stuck in traffic. <laughs> then I share this thought of what's being pointed at in the Buddhist tradition actually runs much, much deeper than that. And I share this image of the liberated mind, or the Buddha, <coughs> being in a state of complete peace and ease and joy, even when stuck in traffic. So the Buddha's happiness is completely independent of external conditions. It's completely reliable. Happiness <coughs> is completely reliable at all times and under all conditions. This is what liberation is pointing at. So it doesn't matter if you get stuck in traffic. It really doesn't matter. <coughs> and again much easier said than done. Um, so let's explore this in a bit more depth. And also to explore this as really a, a spectrum of experience. So this spectrum, I've got two ends of this spectrum. So over here on one end is fixed self. And over here on the other end of the spectrum is no self. So this is one of the most, uh, I don't know, most, it's a, I'll call it one of the most misunderstood and easily misunderstood teachings in Buddhism, yeah, this idea that there's no self. Yeah. So rather than trying to figure out what no self is pointing at, we can actually start to explore uh, a movement towards this idea of no self and really just a movement towards something that feels much more spacious, much more free. So I've put this uh, intermediate place over here, which I've referred to as fluid self, in this spectrum. So we've got thick self, fluid self, no self. So here, over here, I've just written a few characteristics of thick self. Fixated, contracted, distracted, and when we can enter into something which is much more fluid, our minds become much more flexible. We become much more spacious. Our minds become much more unified. So I referred to this state last week as a, as a state described commonly as flow, a state of flow, of wholehearted attention. And uh, it's quite interesting to think about, is there a limit to which this fluidity, is, is there a limit to it? And according to the Buddhist tradition, the answer is actually no. That this fluidity is so limitless that at some point it even stops making sense to call what we're experiencing a self, whatever that's supposed to mean. So here I just wrote some words here for no self. Beyond dualism, which I'll say more about later. Wisdom beyond words, and it's deeply mysterious. So no self. Hmm. Now in terms of this idea of beyond dualism, right, how can we use this to help us? How, how, how can we practically apply this idea of dualism and dissolving dualism gradually, if you will. So one very interesting question that will arise in Buddhist circles is this question of whether or not someone is enlightened. Uh, so I know people who will be approached with this question, oh, are you enlightened? Or am I enlightened? Or perhaps even taking the stance of, I am enlightened. So I think this is a really interesting question because the question itself, it tends towards dualism. So there's two states implied, implicit in this question. Either you are enlightened or you're not enlightened. I prefer a question that really brings a spectrum of experience to the fore. And I consider this stepping into a fluid self as just a glimpse of freedom, a taste of freedom, a movement towards freedom. 
So I prefer this question. Uh, and actually, this is what, uh, how I respond to this question. If anybody asks me if I'm enlightened, uh, I basically will say, I have no idea. <laughs> and I actually really don't care. Yeah. And I suggest a different question, which are, uh, are the qualities of the liberated mind arising naturally in your experience? So this is a really important word, naturally. Right? Are the qualities of the liberated mind arising naturally in your experience? So what naturally is pointing at is it's, it's a spontaneous arising of positive qualities. So there's no effort involved. It's, it's actually just simply a natural state. So I've written some examples down here of what are these qualities. Kindness, empathy, wise discernment, patience, virtue, persistence, generosity, equanimity, and peace. And this list goes on. So I think it's quite helpful to think about practice in terms of developing these skills. Noticing when they're present, the strength of them, that sort of thing. Right, so in terms of uh, beyond dualism, I'm going to say more about this. Right, so if you recall last week, if you were here, I put this chart up, uh, which I've redrawn here, that describes how we create suffering for ourselves and also for others as well. Is we can... Uh, our, this is really actually our starting point. This me versus them, or us versus them. You know, we think of ourselves as these separate, isolated selves. And from that arises what I want, which then can quickly progress into I must have. This insistence upon how our experience needs to be for us to be happy. I must have, I must not have. And then that quickly then becomes, now I'm happy or now I'm not happy. And then we know from our experience that this happiness, it, it doesn't last. It's not reliable. So then we just very quickly come back to, I must have, I must not have. And around and around we go. Right, so what I've added to this is I've put this side by side with what are called the eight worldly winds. So these are four pairs and on the left-hand side are things that are desirable, things that I want, things that we want. And on the right-hand side are things that are undesirable, things that we don't want. Uh, so we've got pleasure and pain, <coughs> praise and blame, gain and loss, and status and disgrace. Uh, or perhaps this last one is better stated as good reputation and bad reputation. Right? So, how do we move beyond this, this sort of dualism? It seems like to want pleasure is a good thing. Yeah. So here's the path. It's dissolving dualism gradually. Uh, and actually, in the Buddhist tradition, there's two paths that are stated in the Buddhist tradition. There's a, um, there's a path that's instantaneous, and you will get this in the Pali Canon, where the Buddha will uh, come across someone, or someone will go and speak to the Buddha, and receive a teaching from the Buddha. And in the Pali Canon, it'll say, oh, then the, um, the libera liberated eye, the, the liberation arose in this person. Uh, they, they could see clearly the nature of things. And then they became enlightened. Right? So in the Pali Canon, it can happen instantly. For us, I think that's a lot less common. It's a gradual path. And the Buddha points this out. It's a gradual path. So if it is instantaneous for anyone here, well done. <laughs> and for the rest of us, it's a gradual path. Now we're going to come back to this question that we left off with last week which is, how do we abandon ill will? 
So in the poly canon, there are several, multiple different uh, strategies that are listed by the Buddha. And I've just listed three here. How do we abandon ill will? So the first one here is to observe the arising and the fading away. So what this advice is pointing at, it's pointing at viewing our experience through the lens of impermanence. So if you think about ill will, when it arises, it's not like we're angry 24-7. I don't, th I don't think anybody's angry 24-7. <clears throat> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But at least when I look at my experience, I'm not angry 24-7. I'm not happy 24-7. So I don't know if you've ever noticed this in your experiences, when in a state of anger, just to allow it to arise, and this is one of my, um, my slogans, actually. I, I work a lot with slogans to remind me of the truth, of the nature of things. Is when I'm <coughs> drowning in ill will, <coughs> completely immersed in it, I will just simply say to myself, this too will pass. And this too will pass. So it's very interesting, because it's a very fine line between suppression and repression, you know, which we know that you know, whatever we resist persists. When we suppress things, they don't actually go away. They might momentarily. But here we're actually looking at a much deeper truth, which is the truth of impermanence. All things arise and all things fade away. So it's very interesting to actually turn towards any one of these hindrances and experience them through the lens of impermanence. And I guarantee you, guarantee you, that whatever you're experiencing will change. Absolutely guaranteed. So observe the, observing the array rising and fading away. Another uh, example that's pointed out, or another strategy that's pointed out, is um, considering the consequences. So I think um, no one would argue against <clears throat> this idea that when we get angry, it's painful. It's really painful to get angry. And usually also if we're uh, doing that in relationship to another person, our anger can also be quite hurtful to the other person as well. I don't think anybody would argue that. So we can know this intellectually as an idea. I'm quite convinced that most people do. Yet that's oftentimes, or sometimes, not enough to actually change our behavior. So sometimes knowing something as an intellectual idea is not enough. Right? So one thing I like to do around this is um, I'm a big fan of images as well. There's something about images that... Um, that bypass our cognitive faculties and speak directly to the heart. So images being metaphors or similes, stories, they're placeholders. So I quite like this image for abandoning ill will. And this image, it comes from, uh, from Buddha Gosha, who was an <coughs> Indian um, saint and, and scholar and he described ill will. Uh, he described it, it's like picking up hot coals and throwing them at, at, at another person. That's the way he describes anger. And actually he describes it as picking up either hot coals or excrement and throwing them at another person. And in that act, you, you either burn yourself or you dirty yourself. This is the image that Buddha Gosha shares. Mm -hmm. So, sometimes when I'm in this state, immersed in ill will, I will simply bring this image to mind, and it interrupts this mind stream of ill will. 
Because as the Buddha said, this is an absolutely essential training principle here. That which one brings to mind frequently becomes the tendency of the mind. So the more energy we put into being angry, frustrated, bent out of shape, the more we become angry, frustrated, and bent out of shape, and the more habituated that state of being becomes. So to abandon this state of ill will, or any of the hindrances for that matter, we actually have to interrupt that mind stream. And a good way of interrupting that mind stream is actually by cultivating the opposite. So considering the consequences, there's an image there. How about in terms of cultivating the opposite? Well, there is this image, uh, it's another image um, about cultivating the opposite. It's an image of um, having a peg in a hole and then driving that peg out with another peg. So the first peg could be ill will, and the second peg could be loving kindness, for example. I think that's it for the slides. Perfect. (laughs) So one thing that I have done over the years that I actually continue to do is uh, I have been cultivating an imaginative relationship with the Buddha uh, as described in the Pali Canon. And, um, yeah, it's quite nice. (laughs) Yeah, the Pali Canon, it it can be quite dry, so it helps to bring some imagination to it. And um, I'm going to read you a little story from the Pali Canon. Uh, And this this particular sutta is called Insult. Uh, so this, uh, this sort of comes back to the um, uh, praise and blame, or uh, good reputation, bad reputation. So in this story, there's a Brahmin who comes to visit the Buddha, and this Brahmin is really pissed off. So he, he basically gives it to the Buddha. And then when he's done, the Buddha then asks him these series of questions. And... Uh, It's a very skillful response. So I'd just like to read this to you. Uh, There's two things in the sutta. There's the language of the Blessed One, so that's referring to the Buddha. And there's also this language of Gotama, which was the Buddha's family name. So Gotama also refers to the Buddha as well. Having approached the Blessed One, Brahman Akosa Bhadravada abused and criticized the Blessed One in foul and harsh words. Thus reviled, the Blessed One spoke thus, Well, Brahman, do friends, confidence, relatives, kinsmen, and guests visit you? Yes, Gautama, sometimes friends, confidence, relatives, kinsmen, and guests do visit me. Well, Brahman, do you not offer them snacks of food or tidbits? Yes, Gautama, sometimes I do offer them snacks or food or tidbits. But if, Brahman, they do not accept it, who gets it? If, Gautama, They do not accept it. I get it back. Even so, Brahman, you are abusing us who do not abuse. You are angry with us who do not get angry. You are quarreling with us who do not quarrel. All this is yours. We do not accept. You alone, Brahman, get it back. All this Brahman belongs to you. So I sure wish I could do this on a regular basis. Yeah, I I just love this image. Uh, 
So a friend of mine once shared a little slogan with me, which is getting at the same thing. We are talking about this. And what she likes to say to herself is, oh, not my circus. Not my monkeys. <laughs> not my circus, not my monkeys. You know? It's like, that's, that's not my business. It doesn't really matter what you think, uh, in a way. So there is something here about not taking things personally which is different from not taking things seriously. They're two very, very different things. So to not take something personally is to not be so fixated on what I want, what I must have, what I must not have. Because when we take things personally, we so easily just slide right into this, it's me versus them, us versus them. And then right away we start to polarize. And problems arise. But if we could simply just not accept, and there's so much going on in the world, it's, mm, it's so hard to take on board. It really is. But is it possible to feel deeply and to hold lightly? Is that possible? And according to the Buddhist tradition, it, it is possible. It's very possible. Um, yeah. So actually, I think I would like to pause now. So we've got some time. Um, it's 11.35. A little after 11.35. So I'm wondering if anybody has any questions or comments. Could you say your name first? Uh, Clark. Clark. Yeah, so um, you said something which I hadn't heard before, and I was curious to hear more about it, which was that in the idea of enlightenment, that enlightenment is when certain states arise naturally. And um, when I think about the Eightfold Path, one part of it is right right effort or balanced effort, a certain amount of effort, not too much effort. And so, um, I wasn't sure if what we were saying was that if one achieves complete awakening, at that point, no further effort is necessary. Or that if along the way, there was something about uh, if, you, if you took it to be that there are awakening moments but they're not stabilized or they're not continuous that those require a certain amount of um, effort that's uh, that's there mm. so, if it, so may, maybe this is related is, is when you're describing how uh, there is uh, the Buddha is not upset about things. It's not exact. I think there's maybe some um, extra explanation there because the Buddha was still affected by things, but maybe his relationship was different. So when somebody died that was close to him, he said it was like all the stars in the sky went out. So it's not as if he's always happy, which was the language you used. He's not always happy, but maybe he's not reactive or not attached or not having some secondary reaction to that. And so I guess both the questions are about sort of what our realistic expectations are um, about like how much effort is involved and how much there will be the arising of unpleasantness or the arising of hindrances that we then still need to use some of the techniques you listed. Yeah, yeah. So, so there were a, a couple things, two things in that question. Uh, one had to do with effort and the other one uh, the second thing I heard there had to do with um, the nature of happiness yeah. so in terms of effort uh, actually I'll go back to this to this one here alright so in terms of the five hindrances we've got doubt and indecision in the middle and left and right is ill will and aversion and desire for sense pleasure. 
so call it greed on one end and aversion on the other, or hatred. And then top and bottom, we've got sloth and torpor and restlessness and worry. So these two, sloth and torpor and restlessness and worry, right, uh, I find it quite helpful to think about this pair as, um, as a spectrum of the quality of our effort or the quality of our, our outgoing energy. So down here on this pole of sloth and torpor, our energies can feel very stuck. We can feel quite blocked. You know, a mind that's very sluggish. And up here, with restlessness and worry, our minds can be overly agitated. You know? We can't quite settle into anything. And as we move from this more distracted and cons more distracted state into a more concentrated state, then we leave behind this restlessness and worry and sloth and torpor, and our mind becomes one-pointed, and our mind becomes unified. So in this unification of the mind, there is still effort. So the Buddha got enlightened at age 35, and he taught until he was 80. So he traveled by foot all around India for 45 years, teaching people. So there was a tremendous amount of effort that was involved. But it's not the effort that one might think of from, from our standpoint, from our perspective. So we can add this word beforehand, rather than just saying effort, we can say something about self-willed effort. So perhaps this image of like nose to the grindstone effort. Like you got a big midterm coming up tomorrow, you gotta study, you gotta cram. So it's not that sort of effort. It's an effort, uh, well, the tradition even speaks of like the effort of non-effort. That the effort actually feels like play. That it just simply arises spontaneously and naturally. Let me see if I can understand this. So would it be like you're cooking, this is actually not the way I cook most of the time, mm -hmm. but you're cooking and you taste something and you realize like, oh, you know what, it needs a little salt. And you just put in a little salt and you taste it and you're like, okay, now it's right. It's not like you're sitting there like, oh my God, there's no, it doesn't have enough salt. What am I going to do? This is terrible. How can I cook something like this? This is awful. And then you're agitated as you add hmm. the salt. It's just like a correction, knowing what needs to be done, whether it's, I guess, with the other pair. Well, the other pairs are quite the same. So desire and aversion, it's not the same. But with the energy, it's yeah. adjusting it without judging yourself or thinking that it's catastrophic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the Buddha has also described it, you know, act, um, altruistic activity is simply doing what needs to be done and no more. So it's, a, it's, it's very much a spontaneous response to whatever conditions are arising. Uh, so somehow our effort becomes purified and the effort no longer feels effort, uh, effortful if you will. Actually, the effort of the living mind is actually deeply nourishing, which is another really interesting paradox, uh, is that altruistic activity can actually give us energy, which is kind of interesting, because we may think of effort as, here's how much charge I got in my battery, now I'm, now I'm on empty. But this way of spontaneously uh, responding to the suffering in the world it actually can give us energy. Kind of an interesting frame of reference. Okay, so the second thing that you mentioned in your question had to do with um, uh, happiness. So I refer to a happiness that's reliable at all times and under all conditions. And uh, it's a very good catch, your question about that, uh, because that what I'm saying there is, hmm, let me restate that. I should say it's a contentment. It's a deep contentment. It's a deep emotional and mental stability, an imperturbability uh, that is present under all circumstances, at all times and under all conditions. So the Buddhist path is not about being happy all the time, as you correctly pointed out. 
there is suffering in the world. But what the Buddha doesn't do is he doesn't, as you say, proliferate, mentally proliferate, and add more fire to that fuel, more fuel to that fire of suffering. Uh, so I quite like this image. Of, um, it's like water, ro- drops of water rolling off the back of a duck. So the Buddha is described as someone who is in this world, fully in this world, but not of this world. And again, I'm speaking metaphorically here. (laughs) Any other questions or comments? Clint. This is kind of an ongoing issue for me. That I have trouble sorting out. Um, I, again, I understand the concept that if somebody wrongs me, and not that I carry this out as much as I should, but I, I can understand that I can forgive this person or I can, you know, not not respond with anger or so on. I, I have more difficulty with that when people that I love and care for are, are unjustly hurt, or maybe people, I don't know, but groups of people that, that are suffering because of the actions of a of, of, of privileged few. Um, so, I, I mean, that for me, it's hard for me to, to just be, have anonymity of that. And also, if, if, you, if uh, me or somebody wants to try to respond to that in a way, we're trying to, like, write a a society in justice. Um, it does seem like, I mean, anger is, is an energetic emotion. It does seem like anger does provide the energy to respond rather than just forgiving and, and letting things stay as, as they are. Um, so so I, I, I struggle with the issue about anger because sometimes I think, you know, anger is destructive and hurtful and so on. And sometimes I think anger, if expressed, you know, if, Taken in a certain context, it can be a motivating energy to try to right or wrong. And, and I wonder if you can see that distinction or whether, how you respond to that. Or yeah, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. And it's, um, it's walking the razor's edge, yeah. what you're describing. Uh, so from a, from a Vajrayana standpoint, uh, bring everything on the path. Everything is just energy. And anger as you say, from a Vajrayanic perspective, is energy that can be directed towards good. So there is this idea of conversion. Well, it's an, I'll call it an image, an image of conversion. So this anger can most definitely be used to destructive ends, and it can also be converted to be used towards positive ends as well. Yeah. And it's a razor's edge. You know, we are literally playing with fire. Yeah. Uh, so it does require um, a, quite a mature practice mm-hmm. to be able to um, not get burned. Yeah. Actually, um, I'm, uh, this gentleman, what was your name? Uh, my name is Juan. Uh, Juan. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I had a question about the last slide uh, of your presentation. So there, there was a... Um, just something I just wanted to ask about your experience with your own practice because I um, well I feel uh, lately I've been well I've been very consistent with my practice but um, there has been a lot a lot of attachment I don't suffer so much with the world but like uh, more of an attachment right now and and sometimes I feel that um well, even though I'm meditating and I'm trying to be mindful, sometimes it arises very frequently. And I, I was wondering about this, because I've heard about uh, a lot about considering the consequences of your actions as this um, helpful uh, guidance. Uh, and I, I was wondering, I actually, I, I became very skeptical about logic after I started uh, my practice to, to help me guide things. Um, I've been much more 
uh, I, I, I started trusting much more my intuition, but I was wondering if you feel that this practice of stopping thinking, oh, where, why, where is this coming from? What's going on in my life? Has this been helpful for you? Yes and no. Yeah. So uh, in the Buddhist tradition, there's many different schools of Buddhism which take different approaches. Uh, and uh, there, is, there is a way of practicing that tends to be very, um, that, that really uses our cognitive faculties as the primary um, tool. And uh, so that, and I know people who's, who that's a very effective way for them to practice. For me personally, uh, I'm much more um, predisposed, I'm much more comfortable with actually imaginative practice, you know, working with archetypes and images and symbols and uh, poetic images, this sort of thing. Uh, so I, I would, I would self-describe myself as a, as a faith practitioner rather than call it a, a wisdom practitioner, if you will. Uh, so I think this is really important. This is something that we each need to discover about ourselves. Uh, is that is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and what was your oh, name? Oh, Mike. Mike. Well, yes. What I was going to say is kind of responsive to some thoughts I had about what, what Clint was saying. I mean, to me, I don't know how a Buddhist, but a lot of the thoughts kind of align with like, you know, this sense of like what Buddhism is talking about, that sense of inner coherence, which is independent of, of what's going on in the material world around us is that's where you find peace. That's where I find peace. And at the same time, we do live in a real world and we do get angry. Uh, and, and I think the razor's edge that you talked about for me is maintaining that sense of inner coherence and peace and not acting from anger, but letting that anger remind me where right action in the material world wherein I actually live might be effectively made yes. in response to things that make me angry. Sounds good to me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to say that it helps to make it more real. And, uh, so it's, uh, it's 11.35. Uh, 11.53. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, Jeff? Um, uh, would you consider that you're a, a, a practitioner of Vajrayana Buddhism? Is that how your path has taken you? Uh, no, I, w I, would, I would describe myself as really a, a Mahayana practitioner. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> are, we, are we done? We're out of time. So if you have any further questions, uh, please just come and grab me afterwards. Yeah, I'd love to continue this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Grisha. Um, all right, so our host. Hey, um, I'm your host today. There's, hopefully there's hot water for coffee. Mm -hmm. Because I need, the machines are on, and I'm thinking, of course, during my meditation, did it, did they need to be turned down again. Did somebody need to plug in and then do it? So we'll find out. Uh, there's refreshments. Uh, please put your dirty coffee cup or teacup in the dishwasher when you're finished. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet if you want to be on the directory. Uh, I'll be coming around with a donable. Suggested donation is $10. And then there's people who gather at the door at 12.30 to go to lunch. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, it's been a tradition uh, of uh, GBF to have a uh, Thanksgiving Day potluck. Uh, to have the members and their friends uh, get together and to celebrate the holiday. And that's happening again uh, this Thursday at my place in El Cerrito in the East Bay. And those who, who are interested, uh, please feel free to pick up the flyer out there about the event. And one thing that we ask is let the host, me, know that you're coming. So that uh, we will have enough variety of dishes. And so we'll try to coordinate dishes. But anyway, uh, you can just let me know even the day before, and that'll be fine. <coughs> so if you're coming, please let me know. And again, uh, please join us if, if you're free. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for doing this. Yes. We enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Two things I want to thank Grisha for pitch hitting today as facilitator. Facilitator was six, so he said he would do it. And then, does anybody have information the gym does on uh, Emilio Gonzalez's memorial service? Yes, and I put it on the list so did not, people might get it. Uh, mm -hmm. Tim was asking about it, so I thought we just announce it. Okay, it's December 1st um, in um, Occidental. Um, uh, he died on the 20th of, of, of October. Yeah. Um, the information, are you on the list, sir? I'm signed up, but I barely get anything. <laughs> you do, check it. Are you on Apple or, or, or uh, PC? Um, because I always have to go, I never get it on the inbox. I always have to go um, to a social or promotional thing to see them. Um, anyway, one o'clock, uh, I think it's St. Philip's. This is the little Catholic church where he's taught Shibam for years. Um, and they would like to know if you're coming, but it's going to feed everyone. Um, and if you don't have that information, then I'll, I'll give it to Can you. Can you send it to me and I'll put, I'll put the announcement yeah. back out again? Okay. 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 All right. Yeah, yeah, so it's going to be up in the next. Um, next week, our facilitator is Cass, and he will lead uh, the open discussion, November 23rd. Um, any other announcements? Let's gather some of them. practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.